Morning, everybody. I'm the speaker that's between you and lunch. Don't they always say that's not a good spot to be? Well, I got, I'm going to set my stopwatch, do my best to get you on to what's probably will turn out to be an excellent lunch. So a little bit about Napster. I remember the first time that I Googled Napster. We are not the National Association of Power Skateboard Racing. So that sounds like a fun meeting, too. But I am the national chair um, as of a couple months ago. Uh, you know, following in, in Mary Friend's footsteps that are, that's back there. So I'll be giving you a little bit of an overview today about Napster as a whole. I'll also be putting on my hat occasionally as the Deputy Director of the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety to give you a little bit of state perspective. So a little bit about Napster as an you know, entity. We were created in 1982 as kind of the national voice or the group of all the pipeline state regulators, some of which are represented here today. We represent 52 different pipeline agencies. There might even be a couple different agencies in a particular state, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. We were about 75% of the total regulatory workforce in the US. So the states and FIMS are both kind of you know, functioning in that space where we do pipeline safety regulatory work, doing inspections, doing investigations and such with our respective pipelines. We have oversight of over 2.8 million miles of pipeline. A lot of that being the distribution pipeline that you know each of us probably has a gas meter or something like that at your apartment building or the home in which you live. And I'll read our mission statement. It's kind of at the bottom and maybe a little hard to read. But we strive to strengthen state pipeline safety programs through the promotion of improved pipeline safety standards, education, training, and technology. And I hope I can give you a little bit more of how we carry that mission out as an organization. A little bit about me. I really like that QR code thing. I think I'm going to steal that for our pipeline safety seminar. But I am an engineer uh, kind of by trade, uh, graduate of North Dakota State University of Construction Engineering. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Minnesota. Prior to working in this pipeline safety world, I was working on buildings in the structures world. I'm, again, I I'm work for the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety as our deputy director, so kind of you know, managing the day-to-day -day work of what our inspection staff does. First, I'll start off just kind of talking a little bit about some relationships. First being the relationship between Napster and the Pipeline Safety Trust. Obviously, uh, having Napster here today, it's a, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to get here and speak with you all today. This is my first PST conference. How many people, this is your first? So we have a couple here as well, so we're all kind of new. So I'm really enjoying the, the dialogue that's going on today. So obviously, we, we have the opportunity to have discussions in a conference setting. There's always those really good conference settings or those, those conference conversations you can have at lunch or you know, after dinner or something like that. So I encourage you all to kind of lean into those as well. We're involved in you know, with committees with one another, obviously uh, things like the Liquid Pipeline Advisory Committee, the Gas Pipeline Advisory Committee, both having NAPSER and PST representatives. Um, and obviously we kind of participate in the transparency reviews that if you hop on the PST website, you can find a lot of information about the pipeline safety state programs, including kind of the deep dive that they do on our websites. I know for the state of Minnesota, we were able to make some really good enhancements to our website just to make it more transparent, to hopefully make it more usable to all the, the pipeline safety you know, interest parties that are out there. Obviously, you know, that 2.8 million miles can be sliced and diced in a lot of different ways. The first being really that, that gas transmission and gas distribution pipeline. And I'll dig into a couple different maps, I think, that are interesting in the next couple slides. Um, as Max kind of talked about in his last uh, session, you know, some of us have hazardous liquid programs. I know in our state we have intrastate you know, hazardous liquid that we have oversight of. We have LNG, you know, propane gas systems, underground storage. Uh, you know, facilities that we regulate, and a number of states also collaborate with uh, FIMSA as interstate agents, where, you know, particularly in our state, we act as an interstate agent where we work with FIMSA to conduct interstate inspections on gas and liquid. And also, we wear hats kind of in the damage prevention world as well. Not only pipeline safety damage prevention, but working with, you know, non pipeline infrastructure, telecom, sewer, water, and working with excavation contractors to make sure that everyone is safe when digging around underground utilities. Just kind of a couple maps here that we've been working to um, pull together, and I think this really highlights kind of our, first off, our, our region approach to what we do. We have five NAPS or regions. You'll find that all those regions, you know, kind of get together on, a, on an annual basis where they can talk about maybe, you know, concerns or things that they're working through at a region level, maybe bubble up concerns to the, the national meeting that we would have on an annual basis. But this first slide just gives you kind of a snapshot of the count of the various operators that we have oversight of. And I'll kind of proceed this with just kind of digging in a little deeper on the 
primarily on gas distribution assets, where you can see these are the, the operator counts for private distribution companies that states regulate, followed by municipally operated gas systems, basically where you'd have a city sewer and water kind of group also kind of wearing the hat as a pipeline operator in their respective city, and kind of the Napster involvement of regulating those folks. LPG, uh, liquid propane, basically where you have those propane tanks that are feeding, you know, maybe a, a strip mall or having a, a hotel or something like that. And then gathering lines. This is data based on our progress reports that we submit to FIMS on an annual basis. And obviously with some of the recent gathering line changes, you'll probably see that map change over the course of time. But that's kind of, you know, at least 2021 stats. So in addition to that kind of pipeline safety regulatory work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, we're also involved in many committees, just like many of you, working with FIMSA, API, CGA, NARUC, GPAC, LPAC, where we're working through you know, regulations, technologies, standards, best practices, trying to wrestle with, if there's an you know, industry concern here, how do we, how do we work towards a, you know, a viable improvement or a safety solution? Uh, you can find a listing of our committees listed on our website. Also talk a little bit about FIMSA and states. Uh, first really being the, the role that both FIMSA and states have in the regulatory work that we do. Obviously we have FIMSA acting kind of on the interstate pipeline, uh, you know, realm of you know, regulation of interstate gas and, and hazardous liquid pipelines. And we have the role of the states working primarily in that distribution world and kind of the respective expertises that we both bring to the table. Now, we also have rulemaking. Rulemaking can largely happen on the, the federal level that I think many folks are very familiar with. We also can have rulemaking that happens on the state level. So when we're talking about intrastate pipelines, states may adopt more stringent regulations for their respective intrastate assets. Uh, we might also act you know, and collaborate with FIMSA through that, that federal rulemaking process, just like many of you, you know, in industry or in the public, um, through you know, participation by you know, comments and things like that that can be submitted. Though I would say that we are kind of different in the fact that ultimately we're going to be folks that are regulating those rules as well. We are largely funded uh, through FIMSA grant programs. I'll touch on that a little bit on my next slide. And then obviously we tag team with, with FIMSA as partners through working through technical issues with all of you as industry as well. And I, as I stated before, a number of folks are also acting as interstate agents where we're out doing those hazardous liquid and gas transmission interstate pipeline inspections. A little bit on the grant funding for states, because I think this is kind of an interesting thing um, that you might not know about if, if this is new for you. So many states, as I stated, participate in FIMSA's grant program. These grant programs fund up to 80%, kind of on a reimbursement basis for the pipeline safety regulatory work we do. These gas or these grants are built into, you know, kind of the categories I have listed there where we have gas grants, liquid grants, storage grants, and damage prevention grants. These basically cover, you know, funding for not only the staff, but the tools, the equipment, maybe the rental space that we need for an office, the computers that we use. And they were kind of function on a, on a reimbursement basis on an annual process. Like any grants, there's a pretty good rule book that you have to follow. So much like the pipeline company has a reg book to follow, we have a big thick guideline book that we have to follow. All the way down to you know, qualifications for our inspection staff, intervals for inspections, inspection types, even to the point of what, how funds can be used. You can buy this, you can't buy that, those sorts of things. We participate in annual reporting, so you'll see some of those reporting metrics as I go through my presentation here today. And we also get inspected. So much like a pipeline company has their annual inspection by a regulator, we also get inspected on an annual basis. Where a FIMSA inspector will come out, they'll look at our processes for inspections, they'll look at our procedures, they'll look at the training and qualifications of our staff, and they'll just check up on, you know, are you following your statutes? Are you following your own internal processes and procedures? And they make recommendations. And if you get to the point where you're not following the rules, it can ultimately loss, you know, result in a loss of grant funding for the state. Now I'll kind of dive a little bit into the role of states. So I'll, I'll put my, my pipeline safety hat on and talk a little bit about what we do as a state. And I think you'll find that you know, the first couple of bullets I have there, you're going to find that's very similar across all the states where we're all doing education. We're doing education in the form of, you know, pipeline safety conferences on an annual basis where we collaborate with our, our pipeline companies. We're training them. They're training us on maybe some new things that they're doing. We provide education to the public 
in the form of maybe we're talking about damage prevention. Maybe we're talking about CO2 pipelines. Maybe we're talking about renewable natural gas. Maybe we're talking about how pipelines are constructed. What's the regulatory process look like? We're talking with other government officials. Not everybody out there understands the, the complexity of the pipeline industry and the regulations that apply. We all co conduct inspections of our pipeline companies. So we might be familiar with what the reg book is. We need the operator to understand what's in that reg book. And we also need to go and verify that they're following what's in that regulatory framework for them. When we need to, we utilize our enforcement processes in our respective states to address non-compliances of those regulations. And then when something bad happens, we're out there doing investigations. So we're sending folks out, you know, in the event of an accident, a spill, a fire, or an explosion, an injury, or a fatality, where we're focusing, you know, on people, property, and the environment. And a big takeaway that as, you know, I spend more time in Napser, you really begin to appreciate how every state is different. And I'll touch on that a little bit here in my next slide. The first place that you might see is, is staffing. You might have some programs that have very many people. You might have some programs that maybe have one or two. All is contingent on the amount of infrastructure that they have in their state. A lot of this can really go to the amount of oversight that that particular state has. You might have some states that have gas and liquid programs. You might have some states that maybe they don't have statutory authority over LPG. Maybe they don't have an LNG plant. So really, it's kind of contingent on what is, you know, what is the charge in the state statute of what that agency is spun up to do. You'd even find differences in where that specific regulatory body re resides. Many of our members at NAPSA are part of their Public Utilities Commission, where they're not only focused on the pipeline safety world, they're also kind of focused on those rates. Maybe they're even involved in some of the routing and siting. I know for our agency, we're part of the Department of Public Safety, so we're not really involved in any routing, permitting, or rate setting at all, strictly looking at pipeline safety compliance. Another place that you might find differences is the regulations. As I stated earlier, some states may have additional regulatory requirements for their intrastate assets. I know in Minnesota, we have some more stringent reporting requirements that apply to our intrastate assets. Funding, that's always kind of a big one and you start looking at how every pipeline safety program is funded, it's probably unique across every single state. Some get general fund appropriations. Some have user fees like we have in our states. Some are really heavily dependent on those grant uh, amounts that we get from FIMSA. We have a compendium document on our website that you can be able to kind of dig into some of these things a little bit more if you're interested, and I've provided that link. And I believe all these presentations will be online too, so you should be able to find that and click on some of these links if you have additional questions. I'll talk a little bit about kind of what the inspection process looks like. How many people have been part of a pipeline inspection? We have a couple of people, right? A couple, couple. How many people have not? Probably all the rest of you, right? So hopefully I can give you a little bit of insight to, to what, what that looks like. But kind of in any safety framework, you have inspections, right? You have the company doing inspections. You know, we talked a lot about, we heard a lot about the aviation world. They're doing inspections, you know, throughout their process. You have your pre-flight inspections. We serve as kind of another layer of inspections to what the operator is doing, kind of through the regulatory compliance lens. So whether it's a person from Minnesota, it's somebody from West Virginia, it's somebody from California, they're gonna send out an inspector. They're gonna look at maybe the plans and procedures that an operator has for, for maintenance, for emergency response. We're gonna look at their procedures. We're gonna verify that those are in compliance with the regs that apply to that particular asset. We're gonna look at the training and qualifications. So if, if you're not very familiar with the regs, there are some very specific training and qualification requirements in the regulations. If you're going to operate this valve, if you're going to take this reading, if you're going to do this survey, you have to be qualified. There's procedures that have to be followed. And we're going to check and verify that the personnel that's doing the work is trained and qualified. We're also going to send staff out to those assets. So if it's a reg station, it's a pump, it's a tank, there's going to be an inspector that's going to go through and inspect that as well. Make sure that it's operated and maintained per the code, per the procedures, as well as you know making sure that is it being maintained? Is the operator giving it the love that it needs to make sure that it lasts and make sure that it's safe? I talked a little bit about some of our inspection uh, work. I talked a little bit about some of the grant requirements have, we have. One of those is reporting. So we have a metric that's maybe kind of a weird metric, but it's called an inspection day. That's basically where we're sending out uh, an inspector to do some sort of inspection. They're out there working with the operator, looking at their records, processes, procedures, and each 
inspector under the grant program has to accrue 85 days you know, per year. That's kind of the quota that they need to reach at a minimum. So we break those into buckets on our reports on an annual basis, and I've tried to just roll those up to give you a snapshot of just the work that Napster does, at least you know, 2021, but I'd say most of the time, this is, these are probably pretty consistent numbers. So there's over 54,000 inspection days that were accrued by Napster inspectors in 2021. So that's about 642 FTE if you do the math on it. We break those up into buckets. So if you're looking at that standard comprehensive number, that's kind of the routine O&M inspections. That's going out to reg stations. That's looking at uh, plans, processes, and procedures. There are nearly 30,000 um, inspection days in that area. Design, construction, and testing, that's pretty self-explanatory. That's where an inspector is going out, looking at new services, our new main, looking at the fusion of pipe, looking at pipe being welded, lowered in the ditch, kind of all those different aspects there. Integrity management, looking at those DIMP plans, those transmission integrity management plans. OQ, or operator qualification, again, that's kind of where we're looking at the training and qualification plans for the operator personnel. And then damage prevention. Now that's strictly, you know, pipeline safety damage prevention. That doesn't include the, the telecom damage prevention work that we do or the, you know, outreach and education we're doing with excavation companies as well. Sometimes you find stuff on inspections. So then that's where the state has to utilize its enforcement process. This is a snapshot of what was identified in 2021 by the states. So nearly 12,000 pipeline safety violations were identified. And with that, we have uh, you know, requirements in our guidelines that we need to take a compliance action. So that's basically going through, that's notifying the operator of the violation, issuing a compliance order on how to remedy that violation, and basically getting that to the operator in writing. Now, sometimes civil penalties are issued. There's not a civil penalty that's issued for every violation. Sometimes it's just, we need some work on this thing. There's a gap. You know, please work to adjust that. Sometimes there's things that you know, warrant a civil penalty. Maybe it's something that's been happening for a while. Maybe it's a repeat violation, or maybe it resulted in something that had some pretty serious consequences, and that's where the, the civil penalty uh, amount there is, is utilized. Bear in mind that sometimes some of these violations can carry from one year to another, so it's not always just something that happened in that particular year. You might have rollover things. Maybe we find something today, probably won't have it closed out and rectified until you know, maybe this time next year. A little bit on investigations. So again, when there's a failure, if there's a spill, if there's a release of product, you know, where we have you know, a line hit or something like that, an inspector is going out and conducting an inspection. I think you'd find that most of our pipeline safety programs, they have an on-call person that in the event of an accident or a, 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 you know, an incident, that they're being notified by the pipeline company to go out and conduct an investigation. The first thing that we're gonna do is ensure that the operator is making the area safe. Right? So making sure that how do we minimize that release of product, stop the flow of gas. If there is a house with gas in it, how do we you know, get the house vented and the electric pulled from that house so we don't have an explosion? So those are kind of the, the that's what the first lens or the first cut of things that we work with a, a company on. After the area is made safe, then we really want to dig in to see why did this accident happen? How do we make it not happen again? Right? And then we want to do the, the lessons learned and, and move those things through things like our naps or meetings or you know forums such as this where you know when we have those takeaways and follow up to an accident we really want to make sure that we can use it to prevent that from happening again and obviously if there are you know violations that that's kind of the, the final thing that we look through but certainly looking through compliance as well this is just kind of an additional piece there of how many inspection days were accrued in the last year by the states just in follow-up to accidents and incidents Bearing in mind that some states might have some more stringent criteria. When I'm talking accidents and incidents, largely that kind of falls into the regulatory framework that the operators have to follow. Reportable accidents, as we would call them, through the FIMSA lens. But you know, I, I know our state would have some additional reporting requirements that would have to be followed. As I wrap up, I'll leave a little space for, for um, discussion if anyone has questions but kind of as we, you know i've given you a hopefully a good snapshot of you know naps are you know a very high level a little more of a snapshot of what states do and give you a little you know insight here as to what we're thinking about so i talked a little bit about rulemaking and just kind of that unique perspective that we have as states where 
we're not only the folks that can comment, you know, much like the public, much like the, the operators, we can provide that, that comment. We're the people that at the end of the day also have to apply those regulations, enforce them and inspect for them at the end of the day. So I think that certainly, that highlights, you know, some interest where we really wanna to try to be, you know, in that regulatory making process as much as possible to the extent we can to really understand why the regs are being made, what are the expectations of how those regs are gonna come into play, how do they work. Funding is another big area of, of concern. Um, I talked earlier about how current you know, grant guidelines provide up to 80% funding for estates. We've been more in the realm of the high you know, 60s, middle 60s, as far as a percent reimbursement the last couple of years. So really looking at the additional cost of things, you know, I think everybody's probably feeling that right now. Stuff costs a lot more than it did, right, a couple of years ago. So looking at those increasing costs, as well as looking at the increase in regulatory requirements, we really wanna make sure that we can maximize the amount of funding available to states to do the pipeline safety work that we do. We've talked a lot about RNG, hydrogen, and CO2. Those are all things that I think the comment was made. This is all kind of you know, new territory for lots of us to, to tread. So we really want to make sure that we're getting as educated as possible and really understanding how are these projects going to work, what regulations apply to them. We want to, to the extent possible, really work to streamline our grant processes and our inspection processes to really you know, fully utilize an inspector to make sure that they can go out and do their work efficiently and really utilize the operator's time efficiently as well. Occasionally, we will issue resolutions to FIMSA in areas where we see that regulations maybe need to be changed or clarified. You can find a listing of our resolutions on our website as well. Couple of the, again, I already talked about this a little bit, but took a little survey just in prep for this presentation just to give you an idea of what the lay of the land looks like as far as RNG, hydrogen, and CO2, at least for, through NAPS or member lenses of people that are seeing these projects come on their radar and you know, they're going to they're gonna be faced with regulating these or answering questions about them. So you can see we have about 21 states that have RNG projects you know, existing or you know, coming up soon. We have hydrogen injection. I know six states have proposed projects in that space, as well as the you know, six states with proposed CO2 projects. And being the state of Minnesota, we have all three of those things. So lots of new things to, to kind of tackle as a regulatory agency. Again, looking ahead to staffing increases. Uh, that was another thing you know, I was trying to gauge from our membership. You know, as we look forward, what does it look like for staffing? Uh, with increased regulations, damage prevention, um, you know, activities that we carry out as a state, the increase in gathering line regulations, you know, the forecast of retirements or attrition, and increased regulatory oversight, I think you know, that's a pretty fair statement that we, you know, we see that we need to grow our state inspection staff to kind of tackle these things as we move forward. I hope that gives you a good overview of what we do as the National Association of Pipeline Safety Representatives. I am glad to be here today and certainly you know, welcome any questions anyone might have and certainly be happy to chat with you after I'm done here with the session. Any questions? Yes. From the state perspective, what do you feel is the biggest challenge to the states in being able to effectively fulfill your mission? The question was just kind of, a, you know, what are the challenges to us being effective? I think there's a couple of things, you know, when we look at um, one being staffing. You know, I think as, as a, you know, an association or an organization, you know, different states have different staffing needs. Um, certainly hiring, you know, qualified staff, I think right now is, is a challenge. And I think that sounds like that's kind of a challenge for many people. Um, certainly there can be challenges with just those state statutes and how your state adopts regulations um, and how you bring those into the fold. Some states automatically adopt regulations. Others have kind of a more complicated process to get those regulations into their mix. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, I just wondered. Uh Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, what, is the, what are the safety concerns that are relevant to uh, sequestering or whatever, burying hydrogen? There's, are there, is there a set of, 
of uh, concerns there or constraints on how that can be handled due to safety? Sure. The question is regarding just the safety of hydrogen. I think primarily uh, what we're seeing a lot of at the state level is kind of that hydrogen injection process. And we do currently have regulations that, you know, through our Part 192 regs that would apply. But I think we have a lot of new things that we don't know about with hyd you know, hydrogen. When we're injecting hydrogen into steel pipelines, that can potentially re result in crack propagation. Uh, we have some other things where, you know, if we're talking about emergency response, well, we don't just have the normal natural gas we might be used to, right? We have kind of mixed in another flammable gas, hydrogen, into that. So there's some things like that that I think, you know, there is more study that is needed. There's more study that's, you know, currently working in that, that space just to understand some of those concerns. Another good question. Any Hello, other? thank you. My name's Maury Johnson. I'm a impact owner on a natural gas pipeline in southern West Virginia. Uh, I'm like many, many landowners from all this country. I don't want to be here, but I got drugged into this conversation. Um, whether you're talking about hydrogen or CO2 or natural gas or oil, uh, the way that landowners across this country, and I have talked to hundreds, literally hundreds of them in New Jersey, New York, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, all over this country, uh, we're, as Jane said, we're being fed an obvious line of BS. Uh, it's absurd, some of the things I've heard here today. In what reality would you say that you can't consider safety issues when siting a pipeline of any kind? Our children and our grandchildren are the ones being put at risk. I see a pipeline, a highly explosive 42-inch fat gas pipeline put in a high impact area beside of a brand new Title I school, I mean, beside of it, that is insane. So I hope that the FEMSA and our government will follow the Constitution, ensure the safety and security of the American people. It doesn't say anything about safe, doing the safety of the, and the security of the corporations. I know this is not gonna make people happy. I was just reading a, a report from the explosion of the Columbia Pipeline in West Virginia about 10 years ago. It's about two hours from my home. And they released a report. And it, uh, just a short thing said that it had, that pipeline hadn't been really inspected. I heard it hadn't been inspected for 20 years. But you go to the NTSB report and there's no details. So you need to gain the trust of the American people if you're not going to continue to have oppositions to these kinds of things. So I hope that we get a serious conversation about safety in this country. How many mass casualty events are we going to take before we do that? I think those are good, are good comments, certainly through that, that element of trust. And I think that's where we have things like, you know, forums where we can hopefully discuss some of these things in the open. We have things that, that you know about transparency. I, I think hopefully that the more information we can share from what we do as regulatory bodies can give you more insight to what we do. I think also education is a big piece where you know many of us in the room, it's kind of our day-to-day -day job, right? Where we you know we we live it, we breathe it, we're working with it, and sometimes we forget that yeah, there's people out there that we do need to engage with. We do need to educate them on some of these things. So I think hopefully you know we can. That's where I think, you know, comments like that, we can take those and hopefully make us dig in a little bit more on, on trying to educate folks that, you know, might not be in the know. Thank you. All right. Hello, uh, Dante Swinton, uh, Center for International Environmental Law. Uh, so in one of your slides, you gave information on the number of violations in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. Uh, when you actually calculate out that $6.34 million, it ends up being about $500 per violation, which is almost literally nothing. So I'm curious how uh, Napster and FEMSA are actually going to make these various states, uh, various companies that are uh, responsible for these violations actually held accountable if they're barely being charged for any of them, if at all. So I, I would like some greater clarity on how sure. Napster wants to move forward with that to make sure they actually are paid attention to, especially with the interest in grading, uh, increasing interest in building out hydrogen uh, blend uh, pipelines as well as uh, additional CO2 pipelines. Sure. I think that's an excellent question. I'll try to go back to that slide here if I can, if it'll do it. There we go. 
I think an important thing to point out is not every, and I can really speak very intelligently, hopefully for Minnesota, where not every violation we issue gets a civil penalty involved with it, right? So there might be something where an operator missed a, an interval on, you know, an, an inspection. You know, that might not necessarily be something that gets a, a civil penalty. Now, if we find lots of intervals were missed and we've identified this multiple years in a row, that's obviously where we're going to ratchet up the civil penalties. Some of those state statutory provisions that apply for a specific state also might, you know, kind of drive what enforcement looks like. And as far as the dollar amount that some of those states can, can ut utilize as well. I think typically what you'll find is, you know, at least for our state, that we're going to issue higher civil penalties based on consequences, based on accidents, and based on, off of history. You know, we have all those kind of you know, things highlighted in our statute that you know, charge us to, hey, if there's something that's egregious and it keeps happening, that's where you need to utilize the higher amounts. Is there a cap on that? Do you have a cap on what you can? Yes, we have, in our state, we have 100,000 per day per violation with a million dollar cap. Some might have, you know, similar to what FIMSA has, the 200,000 per day with a 2 million cap but that can really vary all across the board for the states. Good questions. Any other questions? I'll be sticking around up front if anybody has any further questions, be happy to chat with you. Thanks everybody.